The Matt Asher Show is made possible by Key West Adventures. See more of Key West. And by Bascom Grooms Real Estate, selling property in the Keys since the early 1900s. And by Keys Weekly, bringing the world to the Florida Keys and the Florida Keys to the world. <laughs> My guest today is the author of 18 books, including five bestsellers. He's written extensively about America's most powerful families. And I've heard he has some never before released recordings of the Kennedys that we might get to hear. His latest book is centered on a group of extraordinary women or swans who surrounded the author and inventor of the true crime genre. He was kind enough to share with me an advanced copy of his book. And once I read it, I knew we had to invite him out to Moray Bay. makes his way to Moray Bay, he wanted to make a stop at the famed Hemingway House. We're in Key West, we're at the Hemingway House, the famous Hemingway House, where Ernest Hemingway wrote many of his greatest books. Here's the living room. If you're Ernest Hemingway, you're the center of everything. So when you walk in this room, everyone turns and looks at you. That's the way it was. <music> Hemingway shipped the Pilar. At the beginning of World War II, he went out with a, a bunch of intrepid men including Winston Guest, who was the husband of C.Z. Guest, who's in my new book, uh, Capote's Women, to hunt Nazis. Imagine what a crazy idea is. They're out in this boat with, with a machine gun, and they, they're hoping to get the German submarines to surface, and they'll kill them off. I mean, thank, thank goodness for them, they didn't come up on any German submarines, or Hemingway's career would have been a lot shorter than it was. traveler before the term was even invented. He went to Paris, he went to in Paris, he went in safaris in Africa, he went to Cuba, you name it, he was everywhere. That was what part of being a man meant, having these adventures. I like a song with a scary beat. Whether Hemingway was off the coast of Cuba fighting swordfish, you can tap with your or hunting rhinos in Africa, he defined the macho man. Kind of thing. When it's bright and it's breezy, it's so easy to sing. Not only was Hemingway a justly celebrated author, he dabbled in filmmaking. Spanish Earth was a documentary that he did, very, very radical uh, documentary about the on the side of the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. Very, very compelling piece of work. I was invited to see where Papa wrote many of his masterpieces. There's only one Ernest Hemingway. 
but every writer, every author lives the same life. You get up in the morning and you spend your days by yourself in a room like this, isolated, trying to write words that were remembered. We all, we all of my generation wanted to be Ernest Hemingway. Unfortunately, many of us thought the way to be Ernest Hemingway was to get drunk and to live this kind of wild, crazy lives, not to get every morning get up and sit the way he did, writing six or, or to 800 immortal words every morning. Look, I wanted to be Ernest Hemingway too. What did I do? I went off to Nepal in the Peace Corps. I, once, when I, I worked in a factory in France. I worked in a factory in West Virginia. I did all these things as part of my journey to become a writer. I mean, luckily it didn't destroy me. And I was able to, I've been able to make a living writing books. I'm certainly not Ernest Hemingway, but I'm proud of what I've done and the discipline I had. And it's the same kind of discipline that Hemingway had. And people forget this. No matter how much he drank in the previous evening, no matter how much he caroused, he was up at six o'clock in the morning. He was walking over to this room, to sit by himself to write. Every author should come to Key West to go to the Hemingway house. It's just awesome. It's a spiritual journey. You go away taking part of Hemingway with you. Look, look, this pool. He had the first residential pool in Key West. I'm an author too. I don't have a pool. Do I envy him? No. Give the guy 10 pools. He deserved them. This is the place. This is the heart and soul. And just to be here brings tears to my eyes. Writing at its best is a lonely life. He grows in public stature as he sheds his loneliness and often his work deteriorates. For he does his work alone and if he is a good enough writer, he must face eternity or the lack of it each day. For a true writer, each book should be a new beginning or he tries again for something that is beyond attainment. He should always try for something that has never been done or that others have tried and failed. Then sometimes, with good luck, he will succeed. I have spoken too long for a writer. A writer should write what he has to say and not speak it. Larry, welcome to Moray Bay. It's unbelievable. I'm not leaving. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Excellent. Well, I hope you uh, enjoy all of your stay here. Did you enjoy your trip to the uh, museum? To the yeah, to, I mean, to see Hemingway and to see his studio and to be there. It's something I'll never forget. It's just a, a spiritual experience for somebody who's a writer. So the reason we're talking here today is because you wrote a book about a writer, although it's not exactly about the writer, right. it's about his women. Right. Who is it and why did you want to write about his women? Well, it's Truman Capote and I, I, I like writing about women and I'm told I do it fairly well. I'm just fascinated by them and uh, I pay attention to women that maybe that once they weren't, that's how I wrote a book, The Kennedy Women, which is the first time anybody had ever written a multi-generational book about women and put, take, took these women from the back of the stage and put them in the front. This is different. These are the women that, that, that Truman called his swans, were these elegant, rich women who had set out to marry rich men and to find happiness through doing that, and of course, uh, he, the, 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 the novel he was going to write, which was going to be this, this, his masterpiece, was going to be called Answered Prayers. And it was based on what St. Teresa of Avila said, that, that there more, there's more unhappiness in answered prayers than unanswered prayers. And that was the story of their lives, basically. They didn't find happiness. So in some ways, that's a almost a, a trope that you have people who chase after happiness in the form of wealth or other things that people would look at and right. admire or say, oh, I want that. Right. And then they get it and it's not always what they wanted or it doesn't always make them happy. In this case, that really was the case for a lot of these women. 
Yeah, it's a truism, but that doesn't mean it's not true. And it's one of the essential realities that we should, we should realize that it doesn't work. I live in Palm Beach. It doesn't work there. It simply doesn't work. Uh, so there's seven swans in the book, and they come from a variety of backgrounds. Some of them started out with money, and others of them worked very hard to find husbands to marry with a lot of money. That was almost the game in some ways for all of them, was to find a, a man who was prestigious and wealthy, no? That's right. And Edith Wharton is one of my favorite novelists. I don't think it's considered as highly as she should be. But her thesis it would, basically was just that, that these women, uh, they are in, a, this, is, this is the Gilded Age, that these women are in a prison, but, but, but they don't realize they're in a the prison. And that, that was her great theme. And all these years later, and these, these women who came to the fore in the 40s and 50s, it was true then. They set out to have this life, and it, what did it bring them? Uh, Truman Capote wrote the Breakfast at Tiffany's. Holly Go Lightly, she could have been a swan. She didn't have the money. She, she, had, she had just one designer dress. But what does she want in her life? She wanted a rich man. And in the end, she has to leave the country because she was involved with this businessman and something corrupt. And what does she want? Does she want a, a, a phrase book of, of Portuguese phrases because she's going to Rio? Does she want uh, introductions? No. She wants a list of the 50 richest men in Brazil. She's out, again, to find this rich husband, although that search has brought her nothing but pain. So what do you think it is more broadly about this, the attraction of these things. I, I see that not just for women, but also for men. In some ways, we, we like our golden cages. We like the trappings, and then maybe we just get used to the fact that it limits our own ability to do things. Or we stay around people that pander to us, and we don't focus on what we have or don't have. Well, that's interesting. So, in essence, we put ourselves in a bubble, and it's a bubble that maybe works in some ways? Well, I've seen that in Palm Beach. Why, why I live there, I don't know. But for 27 years, I've been there and observed these ultra, very wealthy people. And that, that's the reality of their lives. The, the women, too. These women, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the older guys, they divorce their first wife. They have their young trophy wife. He, she, he dies, leaves them these very rich widows, and they dominate the island. So what do you think it is that attracted Truman, who was famously uh, a gay man, outwardly gay at a time when that wasn't so much a thing, but nonetheless, what do you think attracted him to these women who were very beautiful and fashionable if it wasn't a, a sexual attraction? Well, first of all, first of all Truman liked women. I mean, many heterosexual men, they don't like women. They want to sleep with them, but they're not interested in them. They don't listen to what they say. Just go to a party and see these husbands and wives, and the, and the husband just ignores the wife and just, doesn't care. He's, just, he's, he's, he's done with her emotionally and intellectually. Truman was, Truman, they'd go to a dinner party, and after the dinner party, the men would go for, the, for their cigars to talk about sex and business and sports. He'd stay with the women. He found them so much more interesting and so much more honest. As far as the swans, he, he, he thought their, their lives were work, works of art. They, they took a lot of money, they had these clothes, they dressed, they, 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 they created an art for themselves. When Babe Haley would go into, the, say, the Colony for restaurant, one of the exclusive restaurants in New York, when she walked in, all eyes would turn at her, and they wouldn't think about the dress. There was just this incredible presence that she had. And how did she create that presence? She'd been in an automobile accident when she was 17 years old. Her teeth were knocked out. She had plastic surgery. Uh, the plastic surgery was successful. But every morning she had to get up. She had to put in her false teeth. She, she had to put on makeup before she'd even see her husband. She didn't sleep in the same room with her hus husband, uh, William S. Paley, the head of CBS. She slept in another room, and she got ready and prepared even to see him. So, so part of her art or her creation was within the home itself. And these, these women were all like that. And, and Truman makes the point, it's just not money. A lot of women, ha they have all the money. They couldn't have done that. And even the discipline of staying, staying thin 
staying thin and staying beautiful, in, uh, just not when you're 20 years old anymore. It's, 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 it's not difficult to be beautiful when you're 20. When you're 25, when you're 30 and 40 and 50, it's different. And some of these women could do that when they're 60 years old, they look so much younger, and he appreciated and admired what they've done. Now, now we can look at it and say, what a squandering of money and time. What do they do with their lives? Truman didn't see it that way. I think that the image is obviously very important for these women, and fashion is. But I'm also wondering, before we talk about those things, we see how Truman, you've told me about how Truman is uh, attracted to them, uh, having them in his lives, how they're fascinating to him. I wonder to what is it about Truman that attracts these ladies. It's almost like, it seems to me, that he's something like an emotional support animal to them. He is, and he, look, he could have been a great nonfiction writer. Now, to, be, to write nonfiction, you have to be extreme, incredibly observant to do it right. He did it in cold blood. He also went, went on this trip to, to Russia with, a, with a, 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 a actors, a, the, the black actors doing Porgy and Bess, the first time an a, a, a American uh, theatrical group had come to Russia. And he observed that, and he wrote this incredible piece about that with his observations. No ordinary journalist would have been able to do that. That's how good he was at observing things. And it wasn't just he was observing when he wanted to write about it. He constantly was observing. He saw everything. And in any given scene, he, he was looking at you and he would see everything else is behind you and around you. That, that, he had this almost painful sensitivity to the world around him. And that's why he was a great writer. And I assume that's also why you think he was a great maybe listener and chair with these women, the swans? Well, you have to be a great listener. And again, many men, particularly with women, are not good listeners. They, they just turn away from him. He was a great listener to everybody, partially because he was going to make his art out of this. Everything was, 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 would, would be used one way or another in his writing. Every moment he was working. That's interesting. As I read your book, I hadn't thought about the extent to which Truman himself had turned his life into a performance of sorts. Well, one way he had to do it, first of all, that he was outwardly gay at a time when it was illegal to be, you could be arrested, uh, you could be beaten up. I have a friend in World War II who was an officer in the Navy, and his job was to ferret out gay rings and put them in, put them in the brig. Okay, well, 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 well uh, Truman wasn't in the military at that time, but, that, but that's what he faced too. He didn't give a darn. He was gay and he was proud of it and he lived his life. Nothing, he, he was going to be flamboyantly gay because that's what he wanted to be. That's how he choose, chose to act. That's what it meant being himself. And that was a theatrical performance too. Here I am. I'm Truman Capote, I'm gay, and that's it. It's amazing in some ways the extent to which he would just present himself as he was or perhaps the performance there and essentially just demand that people accept him and accept his presence though it also seems like to some extent the fact that he was gay maybe even to a large extent allowed him access to women that if he were a straight man the husbands would have been much less much more reticent to allow him to be around them that's true but he, he always feared of being, re being being rejected and that that was a possibility he was invited into these homes of the of, of the of the wealthiest people in america but he knew it, knew it he believed in a moment they could turn on him and that was exactly right let's talk a little bit more about what Truman gets out of this. Obviously, he likes being around people. He's highly social. He finds these women interesting. But he also gets something out of this in that he grew up poor, and this allowed him to be in an environment that was a very upper class, spoiled, wealthy, yacht lifestyle environment. Yeah, I mean, his mother, he got that from his mother. You see, his mother wanted to be part of this cafe society. She comes to New York. She, when, he, when he's a child, uh, her, husband, he, her husband leaves her, and she's in New Orleans, and she goes off, and these men in the evening lock, locks him in the, in the hotel room. And he's terrified that, of being left alone and being locked, locked in somewhere. And that, the rest of his life, he has that fear. But, it, but his mother wanted to go to New York, and she marries Capote. Joseph Capote, and she wants, he, he has a job uh, basically as an accountant on Wall Street, and they want to become part of cafe society, which, which is the post-World War II 
airs out society that you get into just if, if you have the money and the presence. You can buy your way into that. And they bought their way into it to a certain extent. Although her husband started embezzling to have the money so they could do this. And that obviously doesn't turn out so well. No, he ends up... Uh, uh, he ends up going to Sing Sing, spending a year in Sing Sing, and before he goes, she commits suicide. So he has, I guess, what might be considered a rough upbringing, though I think a lot of people end up having a fairly rough upbringing, right. even in the upper classes. Actually, one of the things that struck me reading your book was how much the children who grow up in that household, in one sense, they're very privileged, on the other hand, they have something that's not so much a gift as children at the very, very upper reaches of society. It seems like they are almost intentionally bonsai or turned into useless things because a mark of being at that upper level of society is that you can own or have things that cost money but are completely worthless. And it seems like that ethos extends even to the children of the wealthy. Yeah, I mean, you see, it in, you see it in Palm Beach. These kids that go to the Palm Beach Day School, which is the private school, right across the street is the public school, these kids in the public school. Do these kids ever get together? Do they do any events together? No. The private school, they're not going to look, they, these are people you look down and you don't do that. And then, and then like they go on to the Ivy League, they, they, they have these special tutors and things, they go to the Ivy League, and then they go into in the finance business, industry in, in Wall Street, and uh, they marry within their class. They never meet or know anybody beyond that. It's this isolated, tiny world. They have no idea the world they're missing. One of the most interesting things about that world, and there are actually a, f a number of those, is that uh, your life at that level is to some extent performative, at least if you're aspirational. Your home is not just your home. It's a place where parties are thrown, where important people come and visit. And so you are living your life in, in your book. This comes through very strongly. These are people, both the women and the men, who are living their social lives in the public. No, be, beyond that, they have, the servants are there. So how do you live when you have a servant? You, you're, that has to be a performance, too. You're constantly being observed. So, so like in, in one of these marriages with, uh, with uh, C.Z. Guest and her husband Winston Guest that came from an elite old family, a British-American family, I mean, that's what saved their marriage, is there was a performance. They never would, they, 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 they wouldn't speak harsh words when there's servants around, and there are always servants around, and they just, she said, what saved our marriage is, ma is manners. We had manners, and that was their definition of manners. It's not what you and I would call manners, but that's, 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 what, that's what she thinks of as manners. So they were putting on a proper performance and she wanted that to continue. Exactly, exactly. It reminds me a bit of the culture we have right now in terms of Instagram and other platforms where people right now are very openly, once again perhaps, living their lives in public or projecting a particular image and a lot of everyday life becomes the projection of that image. That's exactly right. To me, it's just kind of bizarre and creepy, and I frankly don't understand it. I, I understand it more now after reading your book and right. seeing how this is certainly not a new phenomenon, right. that people would be obsessed with their image. Mm. Image is really for these women everything, right. right? Why do you think fashion and image became so important in that particular time period and among those particular people. Well, it's right after World War II when haute couture, the French, the, the French designers, become American, Americanized and American women start, start to do that. And I see it, I see a political aspect of this. In 1962, I, was, I went to Antioch College at a work study program. And I worked on the What Chair Iowa Patriot Chronicles, the weekly, weekly newspaper in this town of a thousand. And in the high school, the young men wore jeans and, and white t-shirts, and they wanted, they wanted to be what their father was. They wanted to be farmers. The young women went to Sioux City and, and these other places and, and with, with uh, J.C. Penney's, which is an extremely important store then in, in that era, which, which kind of knocked off these clothes, and, and the, 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 these, these clothes that the swans wore. 
And these women, they read about it. There were these columnists that were as widely syndicated as any columnist in work that talked about these women in their clothes and chose pictures of them. So they wanted to dress that way. They didn't want it. They wanted a new kind of life. It, it, was, it was right before Betty Friedan wrote, wrote The Feminine Mystique, and they didn't grasp what it was they wanted and what they were, they, they were missing, but they wanted something else, and the clothes was a political statement to them. It was, it was a statement that this isn't enough. I want something else. So, in a sense, fashion was their entryway into a particular slice of society. Right. No, no, no I wouldn't say that. I mean, I mean fashion was their... It, it was the protest that this life that they were supposed to have and marry, marry this guy in the blue jeans and t-shirt and be a farmer's wife, they didn't want that. And, they, and, and they, it was all kind of, it, it wasn't terribly articulated, but clothes were a way to say, no, no, I want something else. Something better, something yeah. different. Yeah. yeah. Mostly they didn't get it though, or they didn't get something that was rich and fulfilling. Right, and many of them like, uh, you know, Holly Go Lightly, that, that, that uh, Truman talks about her coming to New York. All these young women come to, women come, come into New York, you know, having these visions, often, uh, not a job, but finding a rich man. They, they wanted to find what they thought was a rich man, and most of them ended up like Holly Go Lightly. It didn't work out. Your book is about the women in Truman Capote's life, the swans, but it's also a book about a book, a book that Truman himself was working on? We th answered prayers. He thought it was going to be his masterpiece. The, the title was based on St. Teresa of Avila, who said there are more, more unhappiness over answered prayers than unanswered prayers. So he got, he got at the beginning what these women's lives were like. This is going to be his, his Edith Wharton kind of masterpiece, his, the great book, the, the book that we'd be reading forever. He told everyone that, and that's what he thought it would be. And he worked on it for years. Years he worked on it. Years. But then what happened? What happened is he, people didn't believe him. All these years, Where, where's your book, Truman? Why can't you write it? He had to give back some of his money he got for a movie for it. And so finally he decided to run a chapter of it in Esquire magazine in November of 1976. It was called La Cote Basse 1965. And in it, in it, he savaged several of the swans of his closest friends, savage them. Now, sure, any author, you have to use your material for whatever it is, but you could fictionalize this in a way. But he almost wanted, he wanted the, 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 us to, them to see that this was about them, that these ugly stories about them, some of which are true, some weren't true. He didn't care, he put them in there, and they rightfully got upset and didn't want nothing, anything to do with him. And that was devastating to him because he needed, he needed their friendship. He needed, needed to be around them, and he didn't have them any longer. What do you think it was about him that he wasn't able to recognize that this was not going to be a good thing for him, at least on the level of his relationships? Well, he was warned by several people, don't do this, don't do this. And he said to Gerald Clark, his, his biography, they're just too stupid. They're not going to understand, which was ridiculous. He just, he was an egomaniac. He was obsessed with himself, and he thought he, could, thought he could get away with anything, and he couldn't. He couldn't and didn't, and didn't deserve to. Some, some of the critics afterwards said, oh, these, these snotty elite women, he gave them just what they deserve. And I don't see that at all. These were, these were his dear friends. He owed them more than that. He really did. He was opportunistic in all ways, though. Well, was that opportunistic to do that and to ruin your friendships and not to write the masterpiece you could have written? And he could have written it. He had, you can see in my book what a masterpiece he could have written based on these lives, but, but he just didn't do it. Do you think it would have been a masterpiece? I got the feeling reading through that, although I can't say that I've read the Esquire right. um, chapter, but I get the feeling that it would have been more a series of anecdotes about gossip and this person doing this with this person and it's hard for me to see how he would have gotten to a deeper level of understanding about people's lives and not just presented a series of rich beautiful people doing things that maybe they shouldn't be doing. But he'd, he had done that before in his, in his short fiction. He, 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 had, he had dealt with incredible depth of people's lives. 
I mean, he's written, I mean, Breakfast at Tiffany's will live forever, so will in cold blood. He had the ability. And that, that's what's so strange. And just because these people are rich and privileged and live these lives of, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, beyond us, doesn't mean that you can't write a book about them that's a great book. Proust wrote about an elite group in, in Fr of French people, right? He wrote a masterpiece. Edith Wharton wrote several brilliant books about that, but that world. Let's talk for a moment about the book you just mentioned in Cold Blood. It doesn't play much of a role in your book, but it certainly played a, an important role in Truman's life, and you do discuss it somewhat. Do you think that that writing the exercise of writing that book and the engagement that he had with the central players in that book hurt him in a way that he never recovered from? Well, he was in love with Perry Smith, one of the, one of the two killers. And was that a physical relationship? There's some dispute about that. And he, and he was an emotionally deep person. To enter the lives of anybody as an author, if you really enter into it, is a dangerous thing to do. And he entered into the lives of these two killers and this, this dastardly crime. He, and he didn't excuse it. It's not some sort of ultra-liberal take on that, you know, these murderers had these poor backgrounds and, and, uh, and, they, and, they, they, and that, that's, that's why they did this. No. No, it is a very tough look at, at uh, uh, look at these lives. I see what he did there, and I see the talent in it, but I must say that I find the entire exercise somewhat repugnant, and especially the genre that it's spawned. Uh. True crime, to me, seems very often like a way to peer voyeuristically into awful scenes, to rubberneck, and... I don't think in a necessarily good way. It seems like very often we want to be able to look at horror and then we also want to be at the same time assuaged that we're doing this for some reason that's noble or there's some little dusting of morality that goes on top of a very violent tale and that somehow makes it okay. We rise up and make these people who are murderers central figures. And I don't know that I like what that does to us. I th think it depends how it's done. You, do, do you blame Dostoevsky? Should, should he not have written about a, about a murderer? I mean, do, do, do you think that Tolstoy shouldn't have written the ugly about ba ba murder, but deaths on the battlefield? No, it depends how you do it. The, 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 the unfortunate thing with Truman, is he was the first person, he kind of invented this true crime genre, okay? Now it's become a total cliche. It's become such a cliche that when you see the movie in Cold Blood that was published, that, that, that came out a year after the book, which was then got all the awards, it was just a brilliant film, it's, it's just another episode of Law and Order. It, it, it had become this kind of, kind of this cliche that you're worried about, that you don't want to squander your time on this, looking at this nonsense. Certainly, the template has been has held up much better than its reproductions right. uh, in that genre. Though it is interesting when we are and aren't comfortable, almost reveling in tales that uh, that really put at the center of them really horrible people. Well, I don't see a problem with that. With what he did with this, with, with, with tell, telling that story, I mean, it, it was the time. Again, he was, he, was, he was ahead of his time. And death and violence, violence was going to become a dominant theme in American life. And he was ahead of that. He was ahead of that. Talk a little bit more about that. What do you mean by violence was going to become a dominant theme? Well, we'd see, we'd, we'd see violence in American cities. We'd see, we'd, we'd see the murder rate go up. We'd see all these things happening. And we, we, we'd, it, always, it always been a violent country, an incredibly violent country, right, with the number of guns we have. It's, it, 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 we've always had great violence and almost kind of, almost didn't like, maybe didn't like it, but it was part of what we were. And we boasted about the, the freedom we had that, that, and this violence was, was always there. But uh, it, it just came, almost overwhelmed us in the 60s. And he was ahead of it. He was, he, you know, he was ahead, just as he was, this, this is a total aside, but in uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, uh, that, was, it was, that was a year before Betty Friedan, the feminine mystique. And that character, they kind of, and, and Betty Friedan said, nobody was writing about the, yearn, the yearning that women had, 
Okay, nobody wrote about that for 20 years. Well, Truman wrote about it. Truman wrote of it in Holy Go Lightly. He understood that yearning that women had. He didn't understand the political way. He didn't write political books, but it was there. And, and just as in Cold Blood, he, he, he some on some level sensed what was about to happen. He read this story in the New York Times. He, he, he looked at it. He thought there's something special about, about the murder in this Kansas town, the murder of this family. He thought, this is something I want to do. Plus, that was a time when he was writing answered prayers. And I think he was having trouble. He, he couldn't grasp how to do it. And so that's what he decided to do in Cold Blood before he did answer prayers. So do you think to some extent that was a diversion from Answered prayers? Yeah, because answer prayer, he, he, he loved in cold blood that that was not going to be his masterpiece. Answered prayers was going to be his masterpiece. And I say he could have done that and should have done that. You think he should have finished Answered Prayers? I, I, th I think he could have written that masterpiece. I th he, look, the problem was he, he, he was a miniaturist. Most, most of his books were, quite, were short. I mean, novellas or in cold blood was long. But, but, but other than that, no. But could he reach out, could he grasp out and do that and do it? But I, I think he could have. It would have been very hard. And very, that's what a writer's life is, to do something that is incredibly hard. That's the only thing worth doing. Speaking of a writer's life, you've written a number of books. This is the second one to focus on women. You also wrote The Kennedy Women. Obviously, this is a recurring theme. But Tell me just a little bit about that particular project. I understand that you maybe have some tapes related to that? Yeah, I, I had interviews with all the Kennedys. I mean, they're difficult to deal with. They wouldn't answer my letters. They wouldn't answer my phone calls. And I went one, uh, the, 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 the Special Olympic Games were held in, in Minneapolis, and I went out there. And I, Sarge, Eunice Shriver, who started Special Olympics, maybe the best thing the Kennedy family ever did, and her husband Sarge were going around every day. And I just, I just got in the limo. I, did, I didn't ask them. I just got in the limo. If I'd asked them, they said, but no, but, but, but so they just let me go, and they become friendly with me. And through that, I interviewed all the Kennedys. And I was able to write, um, I mean, I just, nobody ever written anything like this before. To me, the most, imp the most, interesting, unique thing about this was Bridget Murphy, who in, in 1849, Bridget Murphy, Murphy Bridget, Bridget was the most common Irish name. Bridget Murphy took a boat to come to Boston. On the boat she meets, she was, 20, she was, she was 25, and she, on the boat she meets Patrick Kennedy, who's a couple years younger. They get married. She learned about America as a servant. Now what's interesting is that the Boston Brahmin, the Boston elite, they called their servants Bridget. That was the generic name. They didn't, even bother, they didn't even bother learning their name. So you look, the name Bridget disappeared from American life for 100 years. But she then, uh, after doing that, she started a little notion store and became, she was a literate woman, but she came the mo became the most successful woman in East Boston. And then she, uh, Everything was, for, she sent the son, her daughters off to work in the mills, although she, so, although she had shown what a woman could do. And then she, uh, she gave everything to her son, start a, 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 a tavern. And he built that tavern into a wholesale business, uh, and that's the beginning of the, of the Kennedy money. And it's his son, Joe Kennedy, who's, who we think of as the founder. But the real founder of the Kennedy founder, family, to my mind, is Bridget Murphy Kennedy. Well, that'll make it even more interesting to yeah. dig into the tapes. I really appreciate you sharing those with us. I, I imagine we'll find some gems in there. But, it's, it, but the problem with the book is that the men are so powerful that the tendency is to kind of start writing about the men, and that's what's happened with so many books. <laughs> huh? But I think it's great to talk about the women. No, 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 no I've got... Uh, but also, I think it has, it has a lot to do with how society looks on women, too. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, you know, if you had a strong woman right. in the 50s, she just didn't fit in. Exactly. Well, see, you know? see, even Eunice talked about that, about what yeah. it was like when she, when she got out of school and she couldn't find it. What was she going to do? What was the place for her? Could you give us a little bit of background on the tapes? Well, I, I taped all these, uh, all the women. Uh, one of the most interesting things was Joan Kennedy. I mean, Joan Kennedy was a student in Manhattanville, and Jean Kennedy, uh, Smith, Jean Kennedy, uh, saw her and thought she was perfect for Teddy. She was a virgin, she was Catholic, she was beautiful. They, when they dated, they always were chaperone. They had no time to, to, alone at all. And, and she 
decided to marry him. Again, it's this classic thing of wanting to marry a rich person, right? And think you find happiness or a powerful person with that. So they go off on their honeymoon and they come back. Well, one of the wedding gifts was a film of the wedding. It was very unusual then. It's a film of the wedding. And she sits down to look at the, to look at the film. And there, uh, T Teddy and Jack had been miked. Mm -hmm. And before the wedding, they're standing behind the altar having a conversation. And Jack says to Teddy, you know, don't worry about it. You can screw around just as much after you get married as before. And she sits there appalled and realizing what she's gotten herself into. I think that's a, a great story. It, your book is about relationships and many, many, many affairs. Right. People marrying people and having sex with other people. Right. It's a book about passionate relationships that happen on the side. But it, it strikes me how much in your book the women and the men too, to a large extent, are marrying very strategically. Oh, that's what the Kennedys are all about. You marry up. You, you don't you don't you don't waste you don't waste a, a moment of them. I mean, it's very strange. It's total aside, but I was talking to my daughter the other day about somebody marrying marrying up, and she got infuriated. But you don't say that. There's no such thing as marrying up, and that's that's her generation. That's what they think. But the Kennedys married up every time. Well, when Joe, who does Joe Kennedy marry? He marries the mayor's daughter, Rose Fitzgerald, right? And then each time they marry somebody above them. That's the whole idea. Social ambition is the one ambition, it's the one sport that if you get caught playing it, you lose. And the Kennedys were great players. Nobody saw what they were doing, but there's no more socially ambitious family in America. Are you familiar with the book Class by Paul Fussell? Yes, I've read it. I find it one of the most interesting uh, nonfiction books out there, and perhaps the only book that sometimes I wish I didn't read, <laughs> in that the particular lens on the world that he presents in that book is one that I have a very hard time turning off now that I've learned how to turn it on. Right. Your daughter's reaction shows how much Americans are uncomfortable with the topic of class. That right. was one of the main themes of his book, that we have a class system in the United States. It's just not something that we like to talk about. No, and we have, we think we have this enormous social mobility. We don't. The European countries have greater social mobility to do that, but we believe that, you know? But the women in your book, they are very cognizant of the class system and aware of the way to play that game, right? They've got it all figured out. They could give lessons, and many people would take it because they wanted that too. I mean, what, what they did is what people, women of that generation did all across America in lesser ways. Because the options were more limited. Right, and they, and they, and, and, and they sought a, uh, somebody above them. They sought a rich person or, 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 or relatively successful person that thought that would, they would achieve something. Like that. But thank goodness, I think that's largely gone. People, people, aren't, people aren't looking at this quite the same way. I mean, some people are. Some people are. In Palm Beach, people... Because what, what you do is you have, uh, you have the social set only your, social, your narrow social set, so you don't see anybody beyond that. You're not going to marry anybody outside the set. When, when, when Jewish Americans are marrying outside their faith in larger numbers than, than, than Protestants or Catholics, why? Before, they were, there was such prejudice that they, they, that, that they could not get outside. Now there's less prejudice, and they're meeting all kinds of people and marry outside the faith. It is striking how much the modern idea of romance is no longer, and marriage is no longer strategic. I don't think people think as much about the strategic implications of the particular marriage that they're about to enter into. And while I think that there's certainly a case to be made that that's wonderful and liberating, right. that we can marry people for romantic or other reasons, I wonder about what's lost in that and to what extent people maybe should be still thinking more strategically about who they marry. Yeah, but what would this strategy be for? With, with, with women that have uh, 
career has absolutely been as successful as a man in the next generation, there probably is not going to be a difference. You don't, you don't have to marry a man because you need to have, have uh, financial stability, right? You've got, it, you've got it on your own. So you've got to marry for a different reason. So you don't, you don't need to have the same strategy. Strategy is a broad term, of right. course. To some extent, strategy in this case would refer to the ability or the importance of marrying someone who is financially comfortable right. and going to provide. But strategy can also be more broadly interpreted as you are looking for someone that you are going to make a good team with or who is going to complement you right. in your journey in life. You, know, you say that because it's surprising to me the way Indian Americans, they're over here, but they're still having their arranged marriages because they kind of like the system. It's, it's, it's to us, it seems fairly appalling to have your parents tell you who you're going to marry, but the parents are very shrewd and, they're, and they're, that's the strategy, that's exactly what they're doing. That definitely still exists. My wife is a wedding photographer yeah. and she focuses on the South Asian market. Right. And uh, wonderful weddings, very colorful. Yeah, they yeah. last several days at a time. And they are still sometimes maybe not um, so much arranged, but very cultivated by the family. Right. And marrying within the culture is just something that you do and you don't marry outside the culture. Right. In the case of the women in your book, there is a specific culture that they want to marry in. There's a specific socioeconomic class right. that they want to be a part of because it provides them with a strategic advantage. And then, of course, it also provides a fairly big downside. Right. Truman Capote said that uh, Bay Paley twice tried to commit suicide. Gloria Guinness, another one of the swans, had a husband who treated her disdainfully she quite likely committed suicide too. So these are tragic endings, and the others may not have done that, but they had these terrible ma marriages that, that, that most of them that left them feeling very, very alone. So they very deliberately chose this lifestyle, even though it obviously had a downside and was not fulfilling. You have a quote from one of the swans, Pamela. Pamela Harriman. That I think shines some light on maybe why they did that, the quote from her is, to live on a lesser scale was to live a lesser life. That's precisely what they thought. And she, what, is it, what does it mean, a lesser scale? I mean, she, she, when, when she uh, had to live a, for a moment, uh, fly tourist once, and, and, and live in her, stay with her, with her son in his, in his apartment in London, I mean, it was like being in a, Outcast, being homeless. How can anyone live that way? I mean, look, I know people in Palm Beach, the woman I wrote about, it. what was the great tragedy of her life? She no longer had a private plane to fly in. She had, she had to fly first class. She had to demean herself to fly first class. And fly they did, all of them. It was amazing to me reading the book. This is not the modern era where flying, flying is cheap and plentiful. Right. People do it all the time. And yet the characters in your book, they're here, they're there, they're in Europe, they're flying here, they're sailing there, right. they're constantly on the move. But in private planes and in these incredible yachts and in, in, these, in these unbelievable states. It's often states where they don't, they don't spend much time there, but they have these things. They have these toys. And they also always seem to converge on one particular place. So maybe this season it's Tangiers, or here it's a, a Mallorca or wherever right. it is. How is it? Is there some kind of bat signal that goes out that tells all of the elites we're all gathering this year in uh, Mallorca? Well, they've got to move on. When the common people start showing up, you've got to get out of there. <laughs> it, it is very much in some ways a, a flight from the common people yeah. and from commonness. Right. One of the favorite quotes I have in the book is talking about Chanel suits. This is from Gloria, right. Gloria Guinness. Right. And she says that Chanel suits are too common to wear in Paris, but they, quote, they're adorable, though, for lonely mountain roads. Yeah, what a way to put it down, because at that point, everybody wanted a Chanel suit. If you got that, you were with it. You were, you were in high style. And she's saying, no, you aren't. You're a loser. You know, the, 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 it's like wearing a Mao suit. Forget it. I've gone beyond that. I'm dressing differently than this now. <laughs> it, it's a wonderful dig at 
Chanel. And it's interesting, the women in your book, they are fashion icons, but their involvement with fashion goes beyond just wearing a particular outfit. They are trendsetters. Some of them are even work for the fashion magazines. Well, uh, yes, or had worked for the fashion magazines when they were young. They didn't, they didn't, do, didn't do, do it any longer. But it was a full-time job to present what they were to the world. And, and, and Truman understood that and appreciated it, although he realized other people might be disdainful of it as a waste of time and money. And yet now people can make money doing exactly that same thing with the uh, influencers. If they get enough followers, then once again people are making money off of their look. Exactly. It's an interesting life to craft a life around an image. What must have been like when Bay Pally walked into one of these restaurants? I mean, Truman said that when you walk in, you, you look neither right or left. You, 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 you just are above that. You just walk on and work, walk forward and everybody's looking at you. That's what they did. There's a certain coolness, too, that's part of that fashion, yeah. how you present yourself a certain above the fray, right. above the hoi polloi, right. certainly, that they had. And some of these people were kind of nice people. I mean, I mean Babe, Babe, in some ways, was a lovely human being. She could be quite generous. Uh, Gloria Gunness, I'd love to sit down with her. She was a very interesting woman. She, she wrote a novel. Her husband wouldn't let her publish it. She had a play that, she, that was going to be on the West End. No, her husband, she, she couldn't do that. So she didn't do that. And so she wrote a column uh, for a fashion magazine at that uh, uh, Harper's Bazaar that was phenomenally successful. She had such insight into fashion. She turned fashion into a philosophy. What do you mean by that? Well, because she thought it was more, first of all, she thought, that her, her idea that was that society went forward because men, would men worked to make money to have beautiful women. Okay, so these beautiful women, where would society be without these beautiful women that men worked, men, men worked for, okay? So, so they thought she, these women were the center of society. So the driving force here was creating something of desire to men which spurred them on to yeah, achieve. And, and not just when you're some cutie at 9, 18 years old, when you're 30 and 40 and 50, and you still are able to create that illusion. And Gloria could do that. Gloria at 60, uh, there's a picture of her in my book at 60. Just spectacular. You can't believe that woman is 60 years old. That, that's, that's what she was able to do with herself. It, it is amazing the kind of timeless elegance that some of the women have. Anorexia was the occupational disease. They had to say them. I mean, I mean, the saying you cannot be too thin or too rich was often attributed to Babe Paley. Of course, that's absurd. You can be too rich. You certainly can be too thin. If you're too thin, you have anorexia, right? When I was reading your book and thinking about that idea of aristocracy, what actually came into my mind was a quote from a character in a movie who is not at all presented as an aristocrat. Are you familiar with the movie Say Anything with John Cusack, the actor? Years, yeah. So he has this great quote in there. I thought about this quite a bit, sir, and I, I would have to say, considering what's waiting out there for me, I don't want to sell anything, buy anything, or process anything as a career. I don't want to sell anything bought or processed, or buy anything sold or processed, or process anything sold, bought, or processed, or repair anything sold, bought, or processed. You know, as a career, I don't want to do that. So uh, my father's in the Army. He wants me to join, but I can't work for that corporation. He wants to be above it all. Well, that's the aristocratic ideal. You don't work. You don't touch anything. You don't touch money. You, you, you're beyond that. And it generally, you know, the idea that it takes three generations to, have, to form a gentleman, and that's basically right. In 10 years, you can use to learn to use the right knife and fork no matter where you were born. But, but you you're not, don't have that coolness. You don't have that distance from it. It takes three generations to have that feeling. And, uh, you know, not, not all of these people in this book had that. But, 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 I mean, certainly uh, uh, W.M.S. Pelly didn't have that, and, because, and, and, and Bay being so close to him didn't have it either. But some, I mean, I mean C.Z. Guest had it. She was a Boston Brahmin. Her husband had it. That, 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 that cool, that cool. One of the interesting things about that cool is that it 
brings things full circle, or maybe it's a, a horseshoe theory of a kind, in that you have people who have very little money and they drive just beater cars. Right. And then in the middle, you have people who are socially striving and they need to drive nice cars. And then you get back to the upper crust or as Fussell says, the top out of sight. And then once again, you have people who are perfectly comfortable driving crappy cars and wearing casual clothes because they're not at all concerned about their social status. But there's not that many of them left because they don't have the money. Because after generations of spending their money and not doing anything, it's gone. That's, that's what's true in Palm Beach. The old wasps, they're finished. So what becomes of the swans as an era? This was a, a time in history, and part of it was Truman, and part of it was these specific women, but it was also, it was a moment. Right. What became of that moment? It lived and died in, in, in the 60s with the, uh, with the hippies and the Cultural Revolution. It just washed away. Style became something else, and that in one way ended it for them. And people didn't have the time for this any longer. Women did, didn't have the time. They were moving on to having different, very different lives of their own. But that doesn't mean that we should diminish what they did. I admire what they did. I really do. Larry, thank you so much for coming out here to Moray Bay and being on the program. Well, talk about living art. Well, it's, a, it's not so bad here, is it? <laughs> well, I very much enjoyed reading your book, and I recommend people check it out. It's a fascinating view into a fascinating world. Thank you. The Matt Asher Show is made possible by Key West Adventures. See more of Key West. And by Bascom Grooms Real Estate, selling property in the Keys since the early 1900s. And by Keys Weekly, bringing the world to the Florida Keys and the Florida Keys to the world.